Let us start with what you already know. Assume there is an object which is moving linearly at a constant velocity, v, like this. Now assume if you apply a force which is neither parallel nor perpendicular to the object's velocity. Something in between, say at an angle theta. Then that force will have two components. One component or part of the force would be in the direction of the velocity, and the other component would be in a direction perpendicular to it. But from Newton's second law, we know that if a force is applied on the object moving at a constant speed, in the direction parallel to the motion of the object, then its speed will change, which we don't want. Because we are discussing a specific case of uniform circular motion where V must be a constant, thus this parallel component of the force, or the force in the tangential direction, must be zero. Therefore, in case of a uniform circular motion, force is always perpendicular to the velocity. In the case of a circle, we know that a tangent line is always perpendicular to the radius of the circle. Therefore, if the velocity of the object acts as a tangent to this circle, then the direction of this perpendicular force will be along the radius, pointing toward the center of the circle. This inward directed force is what keeps the object moving in a circular path, constantly changing the direction of the velocity without changing its magnitude. And we refer to this inward force as the centripetal force or the radial force. A key point to note here is that the tangential or the parallel component of the force is zero only in the case of uniform circular motion, but where the speed remains constant. But in non-uniform circular motion, the speed of the object changes, which means there is a tangential component of force present, which will be non-zero. If this tangential force is in the direction of the velocity, then it will increase the speed, and if it is in the opposite direction of the velocity, then it will decrease the speed, both of which are the cases of non-uniform circular motion. But no matter whether the circular motion is uniform or non-uniform, the radial force will always be non-zero. It will always be present. Thus, if we have both a radial or centripetal force and a tangential force, then we will also have both radial, centripetal acceleration, and tangential acceleration. The radial acceleration changes the direction of the velocity, keeping the object moving in a curved path, while the tangential acceleration changes the magnitude of the velocity, that is, the speed of the object. Tell me in the comments, what will be the value of tangential acceleration in case of uniform circular motion? Now let us increase our vocabulary a bit more. Just as we used displacement, velocity, and acceleration to describe linear motion, we'll use similar ideas to understand circular motion. First is angular displacement, or theta. Instead of linear displacement, which tells how far an object moves in a straight line, we measure how much an object has rotated around a fixed axis of rotation. This is called angular displacement and is measured in radians. By the way, what is this axis of rotation? The axis of rotation is an imaginary straight line around which the ball rotates in a circular motion. Here we have shown that axis of rotation as a blue arrow sticking up from the center of the circle. The ball moves in a circle, always keeping the same distance from that axis of rotation. This line tells us exactly where the circular motion is centered. Think of a playground merry-go-round. The pole in the middle is the axis, and everything spins around it. Angular displacement. It is a vector because it has both a magnitude, angle in radians, and a direction. Its direction is given by the right-hand thumb rule. Curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction of rotation like this. Then the thumb points in the direction of the angular displacement vector along the axis of rotation. So, if an object is rotating counterclockwise when viewed from above, it will point upward, out of the page or screen, and in case of clockwise rotation, it will point downward. By the way, just for some intuition, see how the axis of rotation or the angular displacement vector changes 
when we change the plane in which circular motion takes place. Finding its relation with linear displacement is simple. In circular motion, the object doesn't move in a straight line, but along a curved path or arc. The length of this arc is what we call linear displacement. This arc length depends on two things, how far the object is from the center, which is the r, or radius, and how much it has rotated, which is the angle in radians, called angular displacement, or theta. The relation between these quantities is that the arc length s is equal to r multiplied by theta. If we write properly in terms of vector, then the direction of the linear displacement vector s will be along the arc, that is, tangent to the path, while the angular displacement vector theta will be along the axis of rotation, either into or out of the page, depending on the direction of rotation. The radius vector r points outward from the center to the object like this. So, in vector form, the arc length s is the vector cross product of theta and r written like this. This gives the correct direction for s, which is perpendicular to both r and theta, and hence tangent to the circular path. Let's take an example. Suppose the angular displacement vector theta is 0.5 in the k direction, and the position vector r is 2 in the i direction. That means the object is 2 meters away from the center along the x-axis and it rotates by an angle represented by the vector theta pointing along the z-axis. To find the linear displacement vector s, we take the cross product of theta and r. So s equals, we do 0.5 in the k direction crossed with 2 in the i direction. We use the standard cross product rule for unit vectors. k cross i gives j so we get 0.5 times 2 times k cross i, which gives 1 in the j direction. That means the displacement is 1 meter along the y axis, which is tangent to the circular path, exactly as expected in circular motion. Then we have angular velocity. Just like linear velocity tells us how fast position changes. Similarly, angular velocity is the rate of change of angular displacement and is measured in radians per second. The direction of the angular velocity vector follows the same right-hand thumb rule. If the object spins counterclockwise when viewed from above, the angular velocity vector points upward, out of the plane. If it's spinning clockwise, the vector points downward, into the plane. Now, let's connect angular velocity to linear velocity. In circular motion, linear velocity, or v, is how fast the object is moving along the circular path. This velocity is always tangent to the circle as we have already discussed. The relation between the two is simple. V equals R times omega. We can derive this by simply finding the rate of change of S equals R times theta. In vector form, V equals omega cross R. Finally, we have angular acceleration, or alpha. This is the rotational equivalent of linear acceleration. It tells us how quickly the angular velocity is changing over time, measured in radians per second square. If the object's rotation is getting faster, alpha points in the same direction as omega. So, for counterclockwise rotation, both omega and alpha point upward. But if the rotation is slowing down, like a wheel gradually stopping, alpha points in the opposite direction of omega. For that same counterclockwise rotation, omega still points upward, but alpha points downward into the surface, showing the rotation is losing speed. Now, finally, angular acceleration connects to two types of linear acceleration in circular motion. First, we know that there is tangential acceleration, which is the acceleration along the tangent to the circular path and shows how quickly the linear speed changes. Tangential acceleration equals the radius times the angular acceleration. In vector form, the tangential acceleration is given by alpha cross r. Second, 
there is centripetal acceleration, which always points toward the center of the circle and keeps the object moving in a circular path by changing the direction of velocity. Centripetal acceleration equals the linear velocity v, square over r, or using this, we get r times the square of the angular velocity omega. In vector form, centripetal acceleration is expressed using the angular velocity and linear velocity like this. So it is omega cross v, but v also equals omega cross r, and thus centripetal acceleration equals omega cross omega cross r. Please note that the total linear acceleration of the object in circular motion will simply be equal to the vector sum of tangential and centripetal accelerations. Let me give a simple, solved example. Consider a particle moving in a circular path like this with a radius of two units. At the current moment, the particle is located at this point and it is rotating with a constant angular speed of three radians per second. So find its tangential and centripetal acceleration. Consider x, dy, and z-axis orientation like this. Since the particle is rotating with a constant angular speed, therefore its angular acceleration or alpha will be equal to zero vector, and thus the tangential acceleration will be equal to zero vector. Now the particle is located at this point, which means the radius vector will be like this, and thus r equals 2i or in x direction. Then the particle is rotating counterclockwise, and thus omega equals 3k, or in z direction. So, omega cross r equals 3k cross 2i, or 6j. But centripetal acceleration equals omega cross this thing, and thus it will be 3k cross 6j, or minus 18i or 18, in negative x direction, which will be like this, which is pointing toward the center of the circular path as expected. That was super awesome. You know, introducing vectors here might feel overwhelming at first, but if you get hold of it, then it actually makes things much clearer, because vectors not only give you the magnitude, but also show you the exact direction of each quantity, making the whole motion easier to visualize and understand. Now the time period of a circular motion is the total time taken by an object to complete one full revolution around the circular path. So let me know in the comments what will be the time period for a uniform circular motion having angular speed omega. In the next part of this video series, I will be dealing with a nice problem related to circular motion, and then I will start with rotational mechanics. But I am very tired right now as editing such videos daily takes a lot of time and effort. And thus, I would request all of you to please like, share, and subscribe to this channel so that I can get motivation to make more of such amazing contents. So good.